Well, it's the Sunday before the 4th of July. So I thought we'd talk about two things. We're not supposed to talk about impolite company, <laughs> religion and politics. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm also a legislator. This church taught me at an early age that Jesus only gave two commandments, love God and love neighbor. Christianity is both spiritual and political because politics is just another word for how we treat our neighbors. As a legislator, I passed bills to reduce the cost of prescription drugs, expand access to child care, reform our justice system, and fund our neighborhood schools. Through public policy, I'm trying to make life just a little easier for my neighbors. But loving thy neighbor in the Texas legislature is not easy. When things get hard, I fall back on my faith. During my second term, I enrolled in seminary to follow Jesus' first commandment to love God. As a seminarian and a lawmaker, I'm just starting to understand how these two commands sustain, challenge, and enrich each other in inner life and an outer life. As I was sitting at this intersection of religion and politics, Christian nationalism reared its ugly head at the state capitol. A bill to force every teacher to display the Ten Commandments. A bill to replace school counselors with untrained chaplains. A bill to defund public schools, to subsidize private Christian schools. Religion and politics are on a collision course in this state and in this country. Now we are all asking the same urgent question. What is the relationship between religion and politics, between church and state? The future of Christianity, the future of democracy, depend on our answers. On my first day in office, I put my hand on a Bible and swore an oath to the Constitution, not the other way around. I'm a Christian, but I know the most dangerous form of government is theocracy, because the only thing worse than a tyrant is a tyrant who thinks they're on a mission from God. My faith in Jesus leads me to reject Christian nationalism and commit myself to the project of a multiracial, multicultural, democracy, where we can all freely love God and fully love our neighbors. You know, I put my hand on that Bible because faith is my foundation. My politics grows out of my faith. Jesus is far more radical than any political ideology or political candidate. And when I say radical, I don't mean extreme. The word radical comes from the Latin word for root. Jesus goes to the root of our problems and calls us to deeper love, deeper justice, deeper peace. Jesus should challenge our politics, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, a socialist or a capitalist, a libertarian or a communist. Jesus should challenge our certainties. If our Christianity is not unsettling us, then we're doing it wrong. But too many Christians are putting their politics ahead of their faith. Too many Christians are baptizing their partisanship and calling it Christianity. Faith is not about right versus left. It's about right versus wrong. I learned that here. Our pastor, Dr. Jim Rigby, told us that our love for God and for neighbor requires a commitment to justice. That commitment led him to criticize President Bush for invading Iraq. It also led him to criticize President Obama for drone strikes and mass deportations. Religion should never be partisan, but religion is, by definition, always political. The Roman Empire didn't crucify Jesus for being a nice guy. Crucifixion 
was the punishment for rebels. Jesus challenged the political, economic, religious powers that be. He provoked a direct conflict with the ruling class, with the rich and the powerful, with the men who think they're gods. Jesus took on the system. Anytime a government or a corporation or a church is tyrannical and oppressive, it is in conflict with Jesus. But throughout history, too often, Christians have sided with the rulers of this world, sometimes loudly and sometimes with our silence. By staying neutral, by staying non-political, we are siding with the powerful. We are protecting the status quo. Christianity, at its best, challenged the empire, challenged the feudal system, challenged slavery, challenged Jim Crow. That is what we are called to as Christians, the demolition of domination. And we have to continue that work today. When I was a kid, I remember people walked around with those bracelets with the letters WWJD. What would Jesus do? Well, what would Jesus do about a tax system that benefits the rich over the poor? What would Jesus do about a healthcare system that forces the sick to start GoFundMe pages to afford life-saving surgeries? What would Jesus do about an education system that ties a child's school funding to their community's property wealth? What would Jesus do about a justice system that incarcerates more people than any other country on the face of the earth? And what would Jesus do about an economic system that values profits over the health of our planet? Would he stay in his room and pray? Or would he walk into the seat of power and flip over the tables of injustice? Jesus calls us to do more than offer charity. We as Christians are called to challenge the systems that make charity necessary. The separation of church and state should never be understood as the separation of faith and politics. We all bring our moralities and our philosophies to our politics, and faith is no different. My faith shapes my politics. I hope it shapes yours, like it did for Jimmy Carter, Dr. King, Doris, D Dorothy Day, maybe Doris Day too, <laughs> and, and Cesar Chavez. Christian activism is not Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is elevating our religion over others, dominating our neighbors instead of loving them as ourselves. I don't think Jesus would endorse the Democratic or Republican Party platforms. I think Jesus would challenge America to keep working toward a radical vision of democracy, more rights, more freedoms, more opportunities for more of our neighbors. In today's scripture reading, after Jesus teaches his followers to love thy neighbor, a lawyer pipes up and asks him to define neighbor. It's always the lawyers. <laughs> and Jesus responds with a story about a man who was beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. A priest walks by and does nothing. A religious man walks by and does nothing. Then a Samaritan walks by. Now, for Jesus' listeners, the Samaritans were not just a different religious group. The Samaritans were their sworn enemies. But in Jesus' story, the Samaritan stops, bandages the man's wounds, takes him to an inn, nurses him back to health, and before leaving, pays the innkeeper to look after him. The parable of the Good Samaritan is about so much more than helping people on the side of the road. It is a shocking definition of neighbor. The person who embodies divine love is the other, the outcast, the enemy. That is who Jesus is calling us to love. Theologian Barbara Brown Taylor summed up the meaning of the Good Samaritan when she wrote, the only clear line I draw these days is this. When my religion
tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. The separation of church and state in our First Amendment is a profound act of loving thy neighbor. America is not a Christian nation. It is a nation where you are free to be a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jew or an atheist. America was started by religious minorities fleeing religious persecution. That's the promise of America, a multiracial, multicultural democracy, a melting pot, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. It's a promise that we are still struggling to fulfill today. It's a promise to love our neighbors as ourselves. Not all of our founders were Christians. Some of them weren't even religious. But I think you can hear the radical teachings of Jesus in the words of our declaration. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Democracy is a Christian value. And Christian nationalism is a threat to democracy. Christian nationalists, those who fund it, those who preach it, those who legislate it, are preying on people's fears in a changing world. They're trying to convince us that our neighbors are to blame for our alienation, that domination can calm our anxieties, that democracy is not the solution but the problem. They're undermining our elections and stealing our freedoms. They're indoctrinating students and defunding schools. They're banning books and banning abortion. And some of them want to ban IVF, ban contraception, ban women from voting. Some of them want to ban gay marriage and interracial marriage, all in the name of Jesus. It's been said before that when fascism comes to America, it'll be wrapped in the flag and carrying the cross. Christian nationalists use Christianity to protect their own social, political, and economic power. But the teachings of Jesus are a threat to all power that is not shared. Christian nationalists like to say that our laws should be based on the Bible until they read the words of Jesus. <laughs> Release the prisoners. Welcome the stranger. Liberate the oppressed. Put away your sword. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. I know some Republican politicians who are going to be pretty unhappy living in a Christian nation. <laughs> hey, I'm a progressive Democrat, and the teachings of Jesus unsettle me too. Jesus should unsettle all of us. Jesus challenges the powerful. Christian nationalists indoctrinate the powerless. Instead of posting the Ten Commandments in every classroom, why don't they post money is the root of all evil in every boardroom? Why don't they post do not judge in every courtroom? Why don't they post turn the other cheek in the halls of the Pentagon? Why don't they post it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? Because Christian nationalists are not interested in legislating Christian values. They are only interested in legislating Christian dominance. There you go. Christian nationalism is putting prayer in schools and taking free lunches out. Christian nationalism is teaching the Bible in schools, but refusing to give teachers a pay raise. Christian nationalism is forcing schools to post the Ten Commandments while nominating a candidate for president who has violated almost all of them. It is not about Jesus. It is about power. But Jesus wasn't interested in consolidating power. He was interested in sharing it. When he began his public ministry, he started by announcing the arrival of something he called the kingdom of God, a new world, a new creation, a covenantal community, an upside-down kingdom that would replace 
the kingdoms of the world. Jesus belonged to a tradition of Hebrew prophets who called for this new world, where, in the words of the prophet Micah, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. The first words out of Jesus' mouth are the words of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of God's favor. That's a pretty strong mission statement. But what is the year of God's favor? Jesus is referencing the political, economic tradition of the Torah called Jubilee, in which every seventh year, wealth was shared, debt was forgiven, land was redistributed, and slaves were released. It was a year of rest for the people and the planet, a Sabbath year, a societal reset, a restructuring of power. The Jubilee was central to Jesus' politics. Economic justice is mentioned more than 3,000 times in the Bible. The only miracle to be recorded in all four Gospels is the feeding of the multitude, where Jesus feeds 5,000 people, no questions asked. In fact, daily bread and debt forgiveness are major parts of the Lord's Prayer, in which we as Christians pray to God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is not from this world, but it is for this world. The commandments to love God and neighbor are from the Jewish scriptures. As a Jewish rabbi, Jesus brings them together into a singular command. He's saying, God is found in our relationships. Christianity is filled with mysterious paradoxes, a virgin birth, a crucified God. But perhaps the strangest is the doctrine of the Trinity. God is three in one, one in three. It sounds like religious gobbledygook, but it's actually saying something profound about God, about reality. God is not a distant ruler on a throne. God is a family. God is a community. God is relationship itself. The early Christian mystics said that God is a dance. In one of my favorite poems, the Islamic mystic Hafiz says that we are all invited to join that dance. He says, every child has known God, not the God of names, not the God of don'ts, but the God who only knows four words and keeps repeating them, saying, come dance with me. You don't have to be religious to know this. Sun, moon, earth, proton, neutron, electron. Our universe is relational. We cannot exist without the rest of creation. In Genesis, God said, it is not good for human beings to be alone. We are social animals. We are relational beings. We have shared problems and shared dreams. So much of what Jesus is teaching is right relationship. How to live in community together when we're all so beautifully different. The first followers of Jesus attempted to build communities rooted in sharing power in fulfilling the Jubilee vision, in realizing the kingdom of God. If God is a dance, the kingdom is when we join it. Jesus said this kingdom is in our midst. It's already here. It's all around us. Our hearts are calling us to it. We just have to listen. We see it in the people and animals and places and art that we love the most. We see it during natural disasters when complete strangers pull together to help each other. Across cultures, across religions, we know what it feels like. The kingdom of God is our home. 
God's kingdom is a form of radical democracy where power is truly shared among all people, something Dr. King called the beloved community, what LBJ called the great society, a more perfect union, like the Trinity's dance of right relationship. Democracy at its best balances the needs of the group with the needs of the individual. Majority rule with minority rights, liberty and justice for all. Democracy is not just voting in an election. It's not just laws and institutions. Democracy is a spiritual practice. The practice of listening to each other, of serving one another, of working together, of resolving our conflicts. It requires a humility that we don't have all the right answers. And it requires a deep love of neighbor, especially those who are the most different from us. There is no more important tradition in our American democracy than the peaceful transfer of power. Voluntarily giving up power out of love for our neighbors with whom we disagree the most. It's enemy love, par excellence. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. It's Christ on the cross. And it's why the sight of Christians carrying crosses on January 6th should haunt all of us. Winning in a democracy is not dominating our neighbors. It's persuading them. It's forging a way to live together in peace, to love them as ourselves. True democracy is nonviolent self-governance of thy neighbor, by thy neighbor, for thy neighbor. We don't have a true democracy yet. James Madison admitted that government of the people dies when the people themselves are no longer committed to its revolutionary ideals. If democracy is a spiritual practice, then it requires a moral commitment. That is what healthy religion can help cultivate. That is the relationship between church and state. If the American experiment is going to continue, we need a Christian commitment to democracy. This church, this church showed me what democracy looks like. This church showed me what that commitment looks like. In the 1990s, this church risked everything to bless same-sex marriages. In the 2000s, this church sparked controversy by allowing an atheist to join our congregation. As we speak, this church is providing sanctuary to a mother and son seeking asylum from violence in Guatemala. And last week alone, this church fed over 900 people in our community, no questions asked. Our, our churches, our churches shouldn't just preach the kingdom, our churches should be the kingdom. That is what this country needs now more than ever. Those of us in this moment have a great purpose. We have a grand mission to accomplish together, to do something that has never been done in the history of our species, create a true democracy, an economic, political, social, ecological democracy before it's too late. Systems of domination are killing us and our planet. But as Dr. King said, we still have a choice today. Nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. So on this Sunday, before the 4th of July, let us recommit ourselves to the cause of democracy on earth as it is in heaven.